Hello, this is Michael Medved, and welcome to Great Minds with Michael Medved. This is a program where we try to do something very important every episode. We enlist great thinkers to help in recovering the truths of history and in the history of ideas. Now, sometimes those realities don't conform at all to the more simplistic, uh, serviceable notions that we hear all the time in the media. So be sure to visit our website, mindswithmedved.com, for a listing of past and future programs to see exactly what I'm talking about. Today, my guest is a brilliant historian who's grappled with some of the most difficult and some of the most disturbing of historical questions that are out there, questions about the origin of evil and evil that is still very much alive in today's world. Richard Weikert is a professor of modern European history at California State University, Stanislaus, and he is a senior fellow with Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture. He's the author of many books, and he's actually been a guest on my radio show talking about one of those books, a fascinating recent release called Hitler's Religion. Uh, Dr. Weikert, uh, Professor Weikert, great speaking with you again. Uh, generally, uh, people say, well, there's not much to talk about in terms of Hitler's religion because constantly you hear from people that uh, Hitler got his terrible anti-Semitic ideas directly from Christianity. Is that something of an oversimplification? Yes, quite so. In fact, you, you see a lot of people who want to blame uh, Hitler or blame Christianity for the evils of Hitler. That's a very common trope among uh, atheists and agnostics, skeptics' websites. You see this uh, quite frequently. In fact, I've done a couple debates with uh, atheists also on various uh, radio shows uh, relating to this very question of was Hitler a Christian uh, and such. Uh, and not only was Hitler not a Christian, as I show clearly in my book, uh, but he certainly didn't ever make the claim that he got his anti-Semitism from Catholicism, or even from Luther, for that matter. There's some who try to draw the, the line from Luther as well. Uh, Hitler was a Catholic, though, uh, and he never credits either Luther or the Catholic Church with developing his anti-Semitic ideas. In fact, he actually criticizes them in Mein Kampf for being too soft on uh, the Jews. Uh, and so he sees the Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church uh, as being uh, in cahoots with the Jews in many ways. Uh, and in fact, uh, he was extremely critical of a lot of elements of Christianity because he thought that uh, the Jews had influenced Christianity far too much. Let me just give a couple examples. Uh, he completely rejected the Old Testament because, of course, it was written by Jews. Uh, he also completely rejected all of the Pauline epistles of the New Testament because he claimed that that the Apostle Paul was a sneaky Jewish rabbi who corrupted anything that was good about uh, Christianity. Uh, he had this sort of positive image of Jesus as an Aryan fighter. Uh, he thought that Paul had completely corrupted it from the start. So he, his view of Christianity was that it was cor that if it had some kind of uh, a validity in the teachings of Jesus, which of course he rejected most of the teachings of Jesus too. But, but if it did have any validity there, yeah, it certainly didn't have any validity the, in the thing that Turn the other there. cheek is not he an ideal that you don't associate with Hitler. And he specifically mentions that, in fact, yeah. at, at one point, uh, that the turn the other cheek is not a good way to fight wars uh, when he was in World War I, and so clearly he wasn't interested in that part of Jesus' teaching uh, okay. either. Okay, uh, it, it's so extraordinary, and it's, it's one of those things that, um, that, that comes out in your book. He was raised Catholic, right? Yes. yes, he was baptized, he was confirmed, although even by the time he got confirmed, there's evidence that he may have already been alienated from the Catholic Church. His as godfather, at, at his, or the person that was sponsoring him at his confirmation actually made comments later that he uh, wasn't sure he was even going to go through with it. His mother was more religious than his father? Yes, his mother was fairly devout. His father was a free thinker, so his father was not— uh, uh, in, his father was already, had already rejected Catholicism And, and well. let's be very clear. When, when Hitler was going through his formative years, when he was serving in the army, when he was uh, in, in Munich after the war, was he regularly attending mass, going to confession? From the, time, from the time that he left home, all of the evidence is that he never attended uh, Catholic mass, except for a few occasions where he went to funeral masses or special occasions like that. So uh, he never attended mass. And, and even one of those occasions, by the way, where he attended a funeral mass, which was the mass, uh, a special mass in uh, 
Berlin for uh, the Polish premier Pilsudski when he died. Uh, Goebbels later uh, commented in his diary, so that same day, uh, that Hitler scoffed at the mass that he had just been to. Uh, uh, this is one of those um, those strange st- strange uh, sort of anomalies that I, I have never fully understood, is that uh, Hitler did appear to admire Jesus. He seems yes. to be very positive about the figure of Jesus. But Jesus under... Uh, I mean, obviously, however you trace the ancestry of Jesus, his genealogy is given in two of the Gospels. He seems to be more than one-eighth Jewish. He seems to be considerably Jewish, certainly on his mother's side. Uh, what? How did Hitler contrive to see Jesus as an Aryan? Well, first of all, Hitler was not the first one to do this. Hitler, just about all the ideas that Hitler had were derived from other anti-Semitic thinkers of his day or other uh, thinkers of his day. And a lot of— You're saying he's not original? (laughs) Not at all. He was not an original thinker in any kind of way. And there were a lot of anti-Semitic thinkers before Hitler who had claimed that Jesus was largely Nordic or Aryan. And the way they argued was this. They claimed that the area of Galilee, which is where uh, his mother was from, uh, had been largely Hellenized. And so there was a lot of Greek influence up there, and they thought this also impacted the gene pool there. Uh, And then also, many of them were arguing that uh, Jesus' father was a Roman soldier. Uh, And so, obviously, they didn't believe in the virgin birth. Uh, So they believed that uh, a Roman soldier, and they thought the Romans were Aryan. Uh, So they thought that Jesus did have considerable Aryan blood in him. Okay, but did did they think Greeks were Aryan? Yes. Nordic? Yes. The the Greeks and Romans. (laughs) Basically, they thought anyone that had established a major civilization they thought was Aryan. (laughs) Right. And that, and that they, they had been, that civilizations had collapsed. Their whole, their whole vision of history was that the Aryans had driven civilizations and created civilizations, and then they had collapsed, their civilizations had collapsed, whether it be Egypt, Mesopotamia, whether it be uh, Iran, well, the word Iran even means Aryan, uh, whether it be, uh, so that would be Persia, whether it be the Romans, whether it be the Greeks. They thought they had all been established by fairly pure-blooded Aryans, And that the reason they'd collapsed was because as they conquered other territories, they had interbred with the uh, other inferior races, and this had led then to racial decline and thus uh, the collapse of their civilization. And Hitler, um, uh, basically, uh, given the fact that he was not personally religious, he understood that to fuel his political rise, he had to appeal to some people who were. Sure. And in April, there's a real famous quotation that you'll see in a lot of skeptic websites. Uh, when Hitler in April 1922 made a speech where he called Jesus his Lord and Savior. If you look at the context of that quote, he's actually responding to a Bavarian politician who had criticized him for not being Christian. And so he's trying to basically say, oh, no, no, I really am. <laughs> I really am a Christian in this context. But then if you look at what he was saying privately to people, both at the same time and then even a lot later, uh, clearly, uh, privately, he was telling people that he was not really committed to Christianity, and he was criticizing Christianity both privately and also occasionally publicly. I, I know that there's a very profound record, obviously, of the number of Christian clergy, Christian uh, religious figures who uh, resisted Nazism, uh, who were involved with rescue. Um, I actually met personally a... Um, uh, before he passed away, a uh, Roman Catholic archbishop in in Poland who had been uh, tortured uh, by Dr. Mengele in Auschwitz uh, because he had tried as a very young priest to rescue Jews. Uh, is there is there any indication at all that Hitler felt any compunctions either morally or just tactically with taking on uh, so many figures as as he did from both the Catholic and Lutheran churches. Well, he was wary. He was actually fairly cautious. And you go all the way back even to Mein Kampf, where he's, this is in 1924 and 25, right after he had uh, his failed beer, beer hall putsch and he was in prison and right thereafter. Uh, he writes in Mein Kampf about a Viennese politician named Georg von Schoenerer, who had been the leader of the pan-German movement in Austria while Hitler was living there. And Hitler said that his that he agreed with his philosophy. He agreed with his pan-German nationalism. I mean, Schroeder was an anti-Semite. Schroeder was a a staunch German nationalist. 
Uh, and so Hitler said basically that Schirner got everything right ideologically, but he thought that Schirner had made a huge mistake tactically in politics. And one of the key tactical mistakes was Schirner launched a movement known as the Los von Rom movement, which means free from Rome, which means get out of the Catholic Church. And so Schirner called people out of the Catholic Church, and Hitler said that was a disaster politically. So Hitler was very cautious about taking on the churches because he knew a lot of people were committed to Christianity, and this is one of the reasons why then he's going to feign Christianity himself at times as he's going through his political campaigns. Uh, but then, on the other hand, once Hitler came to power, it's pretty clear that he was trying to whittle away at the influence of the churches wherever he could. So uh, the Hitler Youth programs would meet on Sunday mornings. Uh, they eventually were going to uh, force the Protestant youth organizations and the Catholic youth organizations to become members of the Hitler Youth, or they dissolved them, essentially. They dissolved the Protestant and Catholic youth organizations. So there's all sorts of ways that over the course of the Nazi period that Hitler was trying to whittle away at the power of the churches without a direct frontal onslaught. He knew that it was disastrous to take them on uh, uh, as you know, completely, uh, but he still wanted to try to limit their influence wherever he could. I know that when people insist that, well, Hitler based his evil ideology on Christianity and, and people who are some of the new atheists like to make that case— Part of the answer that, that is often given is also something you challenge in your book, Hitler's Religion, which is the notion that he was really an occultist, that he was actually interested in Eastern religions. Uh, what's the the actual story there? Yeah, well, the, the, in, the involvement with the occultism is very complicated in the Nazi period because there were some Nazis that were into the occult yeah. and were interested in it, uh, particularly Heinrich Himmler. Uh, also, Rudolf Hess, uh, very high up in the Nazi hierarchy, obviously. Uh, these guys were interested in occultism, astrology, and other kinds of things. Hitler, however, behind their backs, very often would criticize them for that. And there's a very uh, strange and interesting, really bizarre uh, scenario that played itself out uh, when Rudolf Hess fled to Scotland to try to broker a deal with the British uh, Rudolf Hess, in May 1941, bailed out over Scotland to try to negotiate with the British. This was uh, just a few weeks before the Nazis were going to invade the Soviet Union, uh, and so he was wanting to get peace with Britain before that happened. Hitler thought he'd gone insane, and Hitler blamed his astrologers uh, and uh, occultists on that episode. And so a couple of weeks after that happened, Hitler instructed the uh, police and SS to round up the occultists, the astrologers, the prognosticators from throughout Germany, and they did, and they threw them in concentration camps. However, strangely, one of these individuals that was rounded up, named Wilhelm Wolf, was uh, released by Himmler to become his own personal astrologer. So the Nazis weren't of one mind themselves on this issue of astrology, but Hitler himself, you look personally him, he, there, the evidence is clearly that he did not believe in astrology and that he rejected most forms of occultism. And did they, the stories about him trying to import, or top Nazis trying to import Tibetan monks during the war? Yeah, that was more Himmler. Himmler was doing these kind. Himmler was interested in the Eastern stuff. Uh, Hitler actually, interestingly, several times criticized Himmler's fascination with the ancient Germans also by saying that when the, the, when the ancient Germans were living in hovels while the Greeks and Romans were living in marble <laughs> palaces, that was, that was Hitler's take on it. So Hitler admired the Greeks and the Romans, not even the ancient, the ancient Germanic uh, peoples, because he thought the Greeks and the Romans had uh, reached the peak of civilization much earlier. Well, he, he surely uh, had some connection with at least to the Nordic gods, to Odin and uh, Wotan and... and uh, and because of his fascination with Wagner, uh, did he take any of the Nordic mythology seriously in terms of religious teaching? No, there's really no evidence that he did. I mean, even the neo-paganism. Again, Himmler did. There were other Nazis that did. The SS tried to play up some of these things. But Hitler, uh, pretty clearly, both privately and also publicly, there were some public statements that he made at Nuremberg, uh, one of the Nuremberg uh, Congresses, where he uh, spoke out against the uh, the neo-paganism that he saw coming into Nazism. So, no, Hitler personally was not interested in the Germanic gods. Okay, so not pagan, not a cult, not Christian. Uh, if 
you were to describe Hitler's personal religious philosophy, did he believe in a, uh, a God who judged good and evil? No, he didn't. Not in the sense that we would think of as judge. Depending on what you mean by judged. In the sense that he thought that, uh, well, let me back up. Hitler believed in a God that was the same as nature. He thought that nature was God. So this is the notion of pantheism. So in the sense that it would judge good and evil by the effects, you know, natural effects of things, then yeah, that, if that's what you mean by judge, then yeah. But not a personal judge, not personally judging a good and evil, right and wrong. Uh, Hitler, uh, and what's interesting about Hitler's belief in nature being God, well, let me back up and say why I believe that. In Mein Kampf, as well as in many other of his writings, speeches, uh, elsewhere, uh, Hitler deifies nature in a lot of different ways. He talks about nature giving commands, so moral commands. Uh, he talks about uh, nature having a will. Uh, and so there's a lot of ways that he personifies nature. In fact, if you look in most English translations, in fact, I think all English translations that I'm aware of, of Mein Kampf, it capitalizes the word nature in a lot of contexts, hmm. uh, which we don't know if Hitler would have done that because they always capitalize yeah, all nouns. nouns right. uh, but still, the translators certainly thought that he was personifying and deifying nature. And I think they're right if you read carefully the, the contexts of it. And, and you, you also mention in, in your book that there are passages where Hitler equates Christianity as a form of terror or as a terror yes. to civilization. Yes, that's in Mein Kampf, the second volume. In fact, interestingly, in the first volume, he warns against alienating Christians, but in the second volume, he actually does have this short passage where he calls Christianity spiritual terror. And one of the things, one of the reasons, getting back to my pantheism issue, one of the reasons, uh, one of the things that Hitler said that he wanted to do after the war was to rebuild the city of Linz into a cultural capital. Linz is where he'd grown up. Uh, and he was wanting to tear down the Catholic church that was sitting on a hill right above Linz called the Perstlingberg, and he was wanting to convert that into a planetarium and observatory. And so he wanted people on Sunday, instead of going to church services, to go to observe the wonders of nature and to stand in awe of nature. And so there's a lot of other indications. Those are not the only indications. Uh, Hitler's secretary herself said that he sort of worshipped the laws of nature. Uh, okay, given all of this, Hitler's religious ideas, such as they were, do you see any existence in our own time that might echo or reflect or continue uh, some of his own conceptions of, of religious reality? Well, of course, uh, except for, well, except for uh, fringe groups, uh, neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and such like that, uh, most of his social Darwinist ideas, of course, are taboo uh, and his anti-Semitism uh, and such. Interestingly, however, after my book Hitler's Religion came out, I did receive an email from a uh, leader of a small neo-Nazi organization who told me that despite my negativity about Hitler, which he didn't appreciate, uh, <laughs> he did think that I had nailed his religious ideas, and he did think that Hitler was a pantheist, and so he was uh, also supporting those ideas. And I also did uh, a little bit of reading about the alt-right, Richard Spencer and others, and there's, there's also, there are quite a few people in the alt-right who are pantheist in their, uh, in their uh, religious orientation. Well, I'm, I'm sure we shouldn't market your book with a stamp on it that says, approved by <laughs> neo-Nazis. <laughs> Uh, the book no. is called Hitler's no. Religion. And uh, Dr. Weikert, you've reminded us all that when we look closely at history and when we aren't satisfied with cliched answers, you could actually find truths and truths that are often not at all what uh, people would expect. You're finding that Hitler was no Christian, uh, no, he wasn't a creationist, uh, nor was he a follower of occult or pagan religions, but rather a pantheist is fascinating, and it's unexpected, and it's important. So for more about Dr. Weikert's work, uh, you can find it. It'll be posted at our website, which is mindswithmedved.com. Minds uh, so thank you for speaking today with us, and uh, I want to encourage our audience to learn more about you and your books by checking out our website, Minds with Medved. There you'll find additional information about Hitler's religion and the roots of Nazi ideology. You'll also find easy ways to subscribe to our program so that you won't 
miss an episode. And be sure to donate to support this ongoing work because illuminating program like this is not free to produce. Keep that in mind. And thank you. I'm Michael Medved.